This episode of Family Trips is brought to you by Nissan. Nissan SUVs have the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. Learn more at NissanUSA.com. Hey, Pashi. Hi, Sufi. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. We just got back from spring break. This is not something that you experience. But now that I have children, spring break is a thing again. Right. I mean, I've experienced spring break, but I right. feel like it's probably a little different. Yeah, it's a little bit different having kids. Like, it's a real thing again. Like, the way when we were kids, spring break rolls around, you sort of had this expectation that your parents have figured something out for you to do. Right. And then, like, once you grow up a little bit more, you're like, I'm going to spring break. Should I get the all-you-can-drink wristband? Sure. And you didn't have that kind of spring break right now. I got it for me, <laughs> but I didn't feel like I should get it for the kids. Yeah, so we went... And again, when I'm like, I don't want anybody who's listening to think I put a second into planning it. You're well aware (laughs) at how good Alexia is at planning things. Yeah. If you tried to plan something, it would be just a mistake. It would just be wasted. Yes. I would argue, not to her, but I would argue that if I said I'm planning this one, she would stop me. She likes to live in a place where she both... Wants me to do it, but doesn't. If she, it, you know, if I actually started, she'd be like, stop, 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 stop. You would also risk sort of getting to where you're going and being in the lobby, let's say, and her being like, we're not, this doesn't work. And then yeah. having to find something else on the fly. Yeah. So it's, you know, I mostly I just want this to be an appreciation post about how happy I am to be married to somebody who's such a good planner. But we went to Costa Rica. And we were on the uh, Pacific side of Costa Rica. And this was a trip. One of the goals of this trip was having the boys learn how to surf. Yeah. And it was great. And they had surf instructors. And by the first day, they were uh, riding little waves in. And it was just, they were really proud of themselves. And they have good balance. It's just you teach kids at a young age to do things. That would be the takeaway here. Yeah. I've surfed twice in my life and I've gotten up twice um, on the second day, Um, but very shaky. And I saw videos of your boys and they're solid. Um, Their hand position is uh, almost comical. Well, the interesting thing, because I I did it a few times and uh, much like skiing, I had that thought of, uh, so wait, we're just, we're going back to where we were. You know what I mean? Like, Yo, yeah. I, you know, like you just go out for the purpose of coming back. Right. And uh, any activity where you, the point is to come back, I'm just like, or what if we cut out the middleman and I just stay here? <laughs> that's, the, that's the spirit. <laughs> that's the spirit, yeah. You know, you. I think when you picture surfers, I think you think one arm each way, right? Yeah. But that's the, the surf instructors are very much, you want to point both arms forward. Right. And there's a cool way to do it, and then there's the way kids who are just learning do it. Yeah, they very much look like posed, awkwardly posed action figures. Yeah, like that, right. Like the sort of cheaper action figures that don't have a lot of arm (laughs) movement (laughs) options. Or like action figures where one arm got melted and bent the wrong way, and they were like, well, this is going to work. Hey, dude, those are my fucking kids you're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> melted action figures. Yeah, like one of their arms, the plastic arm got melted and they were like, well, it's got, yeah. it's a little bit pulled to the other side. We'll just write that ship and then it's gonna. But they were, it was really, I, well, I will tell you this. I, I, you know, I'm not in love with surfing, but I'm in love with watching my boy surf. I genuinely, I think we've established how I feel about the beach. Best hour I could possibly have on the beach is standing there watching my kids surf it's so fascinating so fun and there were a few times where ash would do it with addy on the front of his board yeah that was a lot of fun to watch and then also want you a want to film it and b you got to be at the end of the ride because she's definitely going to just sort of tumble into the surf (laughs) so you kind of got to pick her up out of the water but she loved it she loved being in the water watching her brother surf it was really great yeah um and it only took you 11 hours to get there it uh yeah we don't go anywhere <laughs> under <laughs> ten and a half yeah because with like kids that small when you got three kids yeah uh, under the age of eight you really want them on uh, double digit 
Uh, you want him to? You want to go on a double digit trip with a wife who thinks maybe they shouldn't watch a movie? <laughs> did they watch? He, could they watch a movie? Did they? Uh, did, eventually, there's I, there's this very again best mom in the world, and I you know her instinct is let's bring arts and crafts for the kids. Mm-hmm. There's no ten hour project. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's not like they can do pottery. And then you yeah. know, bring it. You, you know, oh, we got to, yeah, we got to air, we got to carry on kiln. So you bring like sticker books, and they're done before the plane takes off. Yeah, everything. And again, it's a backpack full of things. Yeah, but also they now are old enough to know that little box in front of their on the seat in front of them is movies. Yeah, lots of movies. Lots of movies. I'm gonna play for our, our listeners. Um, you've heard this. Oh my God. The boys went zip lining. You didn't. I didn't. Now there's two reasons I didn't go zip lining. And I want to say I blew it. I should have gone. Okay. And when I saw a video of it, I was like, I should be there. One, I don't love heights. Mm-hmm. And and almost all the zip lines I've seen are are above ground. <laughs> yeah. It seems like it's almost they they, you know, I would I there was a zip line where you were like a foot off the ground. Great. Yeah. But there's none of those. Mm-hmm. No. And then the other thing is, of course, you've kind of ruined zip lines for me. Yeah. Because everybody's like, what's the worst that could happen? Well, it happened to Josh. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sure worse has happened, but yeah, I fell true. out of a zip line and I broke my leg and my back and my jaw. Yeah. Um, so that happened. So if you're already like a little bit afraid of heights and then your brother goes down like that. Yeah. And so. I should say, like, uh, I broke L1 and L2 in my back. Those are vertebrae. Um, but I was fine um, at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, could have been. Could have been a lot worse. Uh, got lucky. Yeah. But I've always heard that Costa Rica has uh, very high uh, safety requirements. Yeah. And I will say that, and again, shout out to Costa Rican zipline community. Once I saw the videos... I was like, oh, yeah, these guys know what they're doing. Yeah, I was just going to say, if you're between Zehuatanejo and Ixtapa, Mexico, and you see a little zip line just off the side of the road there, maybe that one, the safety uh, precautions aren't as well thought out. The sign, you told me the sign even had a question mark. It was like, <laughs> zip line? <laughs> uh, all right, so here's, this is just the audio of Axel... Coming in hot on a zip line. Holy shit, this is fun. Whoa. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> so that I when I saw that, I was like, well, I probably should be up there. But I do, I want my kids to learn. You know, I think it's important for them to learn at a at a pretty young age that their dad's a huge puss. <laughs> <laughs> when when he says, Holy shit, this is fun. Do you know where that comes from? Do you know where he got that? Sadly, I do. He got it from his uncle. His uncle, me? No, his uncle. You know which uncle? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and had he just said it? Had uh, I think now I'm starting to think that his uncle. This is my my wife's brother Tolia. It was a huge part of their life. Yeah, Toto, as he's known. I'm pretty sure now I get the sense he might have fed him the line. Oh. <laughs> So what was like a magical moment of, oh, that's great. I'm like, oh, man. Yeah. Now I got to take this 35-year-old man aside and be like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> hey, dude. It, it did feel so innocent and so pure. Uh, and now it's like, you know, like, oh, now he's just a ventriloquist. For, yeah, uh, for Toto. For a bad influence. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, I'm sure mm-hmm. I'm sure it was fun. It was it a fun. very It was a very great trip. I really... Can't say enough about it. And it was very hot. But I will say this. I'll take hot over cold any day of the week. Um, Okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. (laughs) I was literally, was like, oh, am I, sorry, is this a one-man podcast now? But because, well, I'll just say that we, you know, for my uh, birthday, we went, we were in Colorado. Not in a scheme. We went to sort of, with the kids, we went to this sort of, Beautiful spa resort, but it was too cold. I don't like being. You gotta have better clothes. No, it doesn't matter. I don't want to be outside. I don't want to have to wear 
closed. Like, I don't want to be have a vacation and be like, oh, have fun, but you got to have the right gear. Like, that's what I like about hot. Like, you're not know, like, oh, I forgot to bring shorts. Like, of course you bring shorts. But I like this thing of like, oh, yeah, you'll be fine walking to dinner as long as you have the best gloves in the world. <laughs> you just need decent gloves. I think I have decent gloves. Anyhow, well, I'm glad you blew your birthday. Here's the important thing. I, because I feel like you and I have really got to come off track here. But <laughs> we're about to talk to maybe, I mean, this is kind of spectacular that we were joined by these two incredible people for today's podcast. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't believe when this one sort of came across the wires as, uh, as guests that uh, we're going to be on the show. And uh, so uh, it's uh, Julie Andrews. Dame and, Julie uh, Andrews. Dame uh, Julie Andrews. Her daughter... Emma Walton Hamilton. They co-write children's books together, other books together. And it's the first time, you know, we, as we will establish when we start talking to them, it's the first time we've had a parent and their child on. And it was just a delight from start to finish. And yeah. you're going to listen to them. But first, you're going to listen to me explain to Josh for another 10 minutes why <laughs> I prefer, okay. I just like hot more than cold. Here's Jeff Tweedy. Enjoy. Hi guys. How are you? Good. Nice to meet you both. You it's too. Nice to meet you as well. Thank you for joining us. Well, thanks Thank for you. having us. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Our pleasure. Now, it's very exciting. This is our first mother-daughter duo on the podcast. <laughs> Good. Very happy to break your virginity. And it's thank you very much. I've always <laughs> so you know, I always wanted for with a mother and a daughter. That was always my dream. You're kidding. Come on. There you go. Happy to provide. <laughs> I'm gonna start right in the gutter. This is also the first time uh, I've ever taken a shower for uh, one of these podcasts. Oh, I woke my up goodness. early so I could clean myself up. <laughs> that is hilarious. Whenever we write together remotely like this, if we're on Zoom and we're writing together, mom always sprays perfume. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah, that's... I don't know why, because in, she, only she can see me. Yeah. But I, <laughs> that was when I was in Los Angeles and you were here yeah. uh, in and Long I Island. I certainly and, can't smell you, but I know it makes you feel <laughs> But better, it, so. for some reason, made me feel fresher and more uh, approachable. What would that word be, Don? <laughs> <Yeah. Bit. laughs> no, but it, we laughed at it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to tell you, I smell delicious right now. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yep. Lovely. <laughs> yeah. What is your perfume of choice? Well, I have two, and it depends how I feel and uh, if it's evening, morning, whatever. But oh, uh, there are a lovely. couple that I love very much. <laughs> I Excellent. do feel like if you had a line of just perfume to wear on podcasts, people would buy. I think they would think, I want whatever <laughs> whatever Julie wears for That's podcasts. That's hilarious. What a good idea. <laughs> I think that's an excellent idea. You're also yeah. our first um, podcast guest with a title, uh, Dame Julie oh, Andrews. Okay. Which is very Dame exciting and, as Dame well. Dame and daughter, yeah. Dame and daughter. Yeah. Daughter of a dame. It's so lovely. Oh, wait, no, now, stop, stop, yeah, stop, stop. I wish it conferred a title on me, but it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't go down, right. Sadly no, not. It stops right here. Yeah. You, now you mentioned you guys obviously collaborate uh, via... Zoom a great deal with writing. You you've written over thirty books together. Is that 35, correct? Thirty five. I thirty five. About yeah. thirty five. Uh -huh. Yeah, but there those are you know certain series and things like that. Well, thirty five books is thirty five books. It's yes, uh, yeah, yes, yeah. It's lovely to look to look at the impressive pile. Uh, <laughs> I've written one children's book, and that's a problem because there's really no way to just stack one. One feels... <laughs> Unless you get a lot of them, a lot of copies. Yeah. Yeah, you could do that. You know what I've done, and I'm assuming you've done as well, when they translate it into another language, I find that's a nice way to have... Yes. You only have to write one book, but you can actually make a stack that looks as though you've accomplished more. True. Well, and, they, and they often look different because sometimes the covers are different in different languages. So Now, did you... Were you guys uh, natural collaborators right away when you started writing books together? We were because, I think because we had 
started writing stories together when I was very small. So as young as It five, wasn't deliberate and, and, uh, or intended to be the way we are today, but it was just for our pleasure. And when you went on vacation, let's say, to visit your dad, I would send Emma or she would uh, help write a story or I would help her write a story. And her dad was the wonderful designer, uh, Tony Walton. So, um, and we were very friendly. It was a very amicable uh, separation, believe it or not. And so we would we would take this to Tony and then he would uh, do the illustrations for it. But they didn't become, one became adapted into one of our books, didn't it, darling? Yeah, but, many, many uh, years later. Mostly it was just some some sweet thing that Emma wanted to conjure up or whatever, and then dad would get it and he'd illustrate it and then she'd have it to keep. So it was a nice idea. But I think that's what sort of laid the groundwork for our being able to collaborate together creatively. And then yeah. before and we it was started- was many, many years before we thought about doing that. It was, but it, but also in the interim, before we started writing together, we did a lot of other creative work together. So we were, we acted in a couple of films together I, my husband and I ran a theater, a, a regional theater for 17 years, and we gave mom her directorial debut. And you did. So we have worked together and collaborated creatively in lots of different iterations before we started writing together 25 years ago. So I think it was a natural segue. The great thrill was to find that we were very compatible and that we have different strengths and, uh, and just the pleasure that we get conjuring up some of our characters and we borrow liberally from the family, don't we, darling? You know, <laughs> mad aunts and Steel, uncles and maybe all of that. more than borrow, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Has a family member ever felt as though you borrowed unfairly from who they are? I don't think they ever did, if they ever really knew or wanted to read the books that Truthfully, well, I, my kids, my kids ver are very aware that two of our series were based on them and inspired by them, and and, and also they, written for them to some and extent, written and dedicated to them. Yeah, yeah. and um, they were they were thrilled, and also they were our beta readers. You know, they we would always run the stories by them first, and and if it met mustered on with them, then we knew we were okay. Was there ever one of the books that you wrote for them that you noticed they got tired of a little too quickly? Well, in the stages of writing, if you spelt, you know, I would quite often, particularly with a couple of books, I, I would read it to them at night and say, this is what I got through today and so on and so forth. So if I felt them being restless or a bit squirmy, uh, uh, then I would think that I maybe have to watch that chapter because they... Uh, it doesn't seem like it's gripping them too much. Happily, really happily, they loved the fact that I was reading to them and they love listening in. So, What mom is referring to there is is one of the middle grade novels she wrote independently of me. That's true. I'm sorry. I, that's true. That's, uh -huh. you know, something she wrote when I was a kid and she would test read on me and on my siblings. And that was a middle grade novel with the picture book series that are inspired by my kids and that we test read with them. They did, because they were series and they were picture books, and there were eight or 10 or 12 in, in each series, they did eventually grow out of the the age the group. The age related book. Before yeah. the series ended, but they didn't seem to get tired of of hearing the next installment. And, and they, both series have sadly run their course now. And both kids were disappointed when they did. So oh. that's very sweet. Yeah. I'm glad when you said that Julie wrote them without you, it was when you were too young and not that she just went off on her own and you found out when you were in a bookstore. Oh, that no, she no, 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 no. <laughs> no, somewhere in the middle of starting to write books. It just started as a pleasure for me to do that. And I, I did lose a bet to my eldest, to my stepdaughter. And when I asked what my, it was, we were playing a game and I said, what should my forfeit be? And she said, write me a story. And that's how my writing children's books sort of began. And I enjoyed it so much that I couldn't wait to start another one and so on. So That's, that's a, a good case story. for gambling. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Listen, uh, Seth, what is, what's your book called? My book is called I'm Not Scared, You're Scared. And it's about a bear who is scared and his rabbit friend who is not. Sounds great. And yes, it's, it's a lovely, I, you know, I will say, and I'm sure you will both attest to this as well, one of the great joys of writing 
a book with pictures is not having to do the pictures. Yes. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah. And we're very admiring of the wonderful designers who helped us realize our books. Yeah. I, one of the other great joys of writing picture books is when the illustrations come in, yes. yeah. seeing how much they advance the story. And, and how and much how, we then cut out, yeah. you know, depending. We try not to write what the art will show to the best of our abilities so that yeah. the two, two things work synergistically together. Seth could have beta read his a bit more. It drags in the middle. <laughs> it, it drags. How did a you bit feel more. about it when he came out with a book? I mean, did you wish you had one too, or what? Yeah, was- I mean, I think all in good time. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm very excited that he has a that he has a book on the shelf. A friend of his actually gave it to me. Josh isn't lying. It does. I will say. <laughs> I feel like now, having read it a few times, it does drag a little in the middle. I wish. As with every writer, when people, when young writers say to me, do you have any advice? I always say, it, your first draft is so much longer yeah, than it should it be. Always. And that's true of every writing. That's drama, comedy. And actually, isn't there a law, uh, not a law, um, but a, a kind of uh, outline of, as to how many pages and how many? It depends oh, yeah. on the kind of book. I mean, with, with picture books, there's a real, there are yeah. such strict parameters of word count and page count and all of that that we have to work within. It's which, been a learning curve for both of us, really. And yeah, you're, I, she's, Emma's by far better than I about all of it. And structure. And, well, yeah. only because I it's my primary focus and, and I teach writing and, and so I'm immersed in it so much of the time. But but mom is the ideas person. I'm just Not more of necessarily, the, but well, a lot of the time you are. Beginnings, endings, ends of chapters, left hand turn occasionally, you know mm-hmm. what, what I'm saying. When uh, when I visit Seth's family, he's got a about to be eight year old, six year old, and three year old. Right now, they're yeah. seven, five, oh, and two. Well, it's perfect, Seth. Keep writing. I, yeah. I know, I got to. But yeah. you'll always read stories and sort of lay in bed, and they'll pick books out. And sometimes you'll be given a book that you're like, "This is way too long. This is going to take me." You're all going to fall asleep, and this this is a monster about <laughs> um, all these children that won't eat properly or whatnot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And then you then you edit selectively as you're yeah, reading, yeah. right? But the problem is if they've read it before, they will, ah, they will yeah, know. That's so true. you can't get away with that. Yeah. They know everywhere. And that's the other thing about good picture books is that ideally you want them to say, read it again, read it again. Yeah, you know, But then they know every word and they bust you if you get it wrong. So, but it's yeah. a great tool for learning to read too, the, the picture books particularly. I mean mm. – I couldn't be more thrilled if all children, I mean, just reading to your kid is one of the most important things you could do in that, that in the sense of helping them to be uh, curious and artistic and wanting to be part of the whole scene. They love it when you get the whole family together. I'm sure you know that, Seth. (laughs) It's the best. Yeah, it is. Hey, we're going to take a quick break and hear from some of our sponsors. This episode of Family Trips is brought to you by Nissan. Ever wonder what's around that next corner? Or what happens if you push further? Seth, I know that's something you ask me every day. This is why we're excited to partner with Nissan. So much of this podcast is about families getting together in a car and taking adventures. The car becomes a home away from home. It becomes a wonderful, warm place. We love celebrating family adventures on this podcast called Family Trips. So take a Nissan Road. Nissan Pathfinder or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. And do it in comfort and do it in style. I mean, with the new 2024 Nissan Rogue, the class exclusive Google built-in is your always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. There's no need to connect your phone as Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are built right into the 12.3 inch HD touchscreen infotainment system of the 2024 Nissan Rogue. If mom and dad had this, I could call them and I would say, how far away are you from getting to our house? And they would still say, I don't know, maybe an hour? Well, that's if they answer the phone. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So thanks again to Nissan for sponsoring this episode of Family Trips. Now go find your next big adventure and enjoy the ride along the way. Learn more at NissanUSA.com. 
Support for Family Trips comes from Fidelity. Your entire life you've been told to save and save and save, but has anyone helped you figure out how to spend? With Fidelity Income Planning, we'll help you create a clear, personalized plan for cash flow. One that includes your 401k and all your other accounts. However you want to work with us, either one-on-one or with our planning tools, we'll help you to build a withdrawal strategy for when you're not working. We can help you gain a better understanding of your options to help you make the right decisions to best fit your life ahead. All so you can enjoy whatever comes next. And you can go from saving to living. Learn more at fidelity.com slash income planning. Advisory services provided by Fidelity Personal and Workplace Advisor, LLC, for a fee. Brokerage services by Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC. Now, Emma, your life began pretty much in L.A., correct? Actually, I was born in England. Okay. But yes, then uh, when I was three months old, I went with my mom and my dad to L.A. to because they were both about to start work on Mary Poppins. And I'm and, sorry um, that film didn't work out. I yeah. do apologize. <laughs> you know that her dad, as I said, who was a wonderful designer, did do nearly all the sets and the costumes for Mary Poppins, oh which is an absolute fluke, wonderful thing that, it, of course, it set us both on a path of the movie world, uh, the cinema world, but it was just so, it felt so safe. And Disney was very generous to us both, too. That's really wonderful. Now, did you, you were obviously very busy. You and your husband at the time had Mm. these careers that were taking off. Did you have time to take vacations? Was that something you remember as a... Do you want to take that or shall I am? So what I, we were thinking about this in preparing to speak to you both today, and we realized that most of our vacations together were working vacations for mom. Um, quite often she was on location somewhere making a film, and my step-siblings and my half-siblings and I, we got to reap the benefit of being in whatever place it was that the work was being done. Um, and so we would we would have adventures you know, on her days off and and things like that there. But I can think of some pretty terrific places we got to go, you know, Barbados and Ireland and, you know, England and all sorts of places where she was working south of France, but we got to tag along. Such a tough and, life, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, I because my parents were divorced, I would often spend summers with my dad. And that's where I also had a lot of family vacations with him. It must have been, uh, Julie, I would imagine you get a day off on set. I know how hard it is to be uh, working in a film. You were probably exhausted, but at the same time, you had young kids. And was it important for you on those days off to have the energy to then take adventures with your kids? Yeah, it was very important. And mind you, they they got away mostly with all kinds of things, but uh, got away (laughs) with murder. But but no, it was important because... I have to say there's always that slight guilt that you shouldn't be working, that you should be more of a mum. And, and if they, if the kids were all right, I was all right. But if they had a fever or they things weren't working out for them or there was a big problem for them, I was a basket case. And that's the first focus. But actually, how we did it, I don't know, but we managed. Yeah. Do you recall any adventures you might have gone on when you were in Barbados or in Ireland if you had a day off? I know when I've sort of shot movies, they don't need me every day. No. Uh, I imagine it maybe is different for you. No, there were days like that. Oh, my God. Well, I remember in Ireland, we were there for quite a long time, and we were staying— We started at the beginning of the summer and at the end of summer. Yeah, we went back. Yeah, and we stayed in this extraordinary manor house— where much of the film was shot, but that estate had its own stables and its own dairy and its own lake with a folly and all sorts of places to explore. And there were horses in the stables, and so Mom and I— Well, actually, Blake put them there, darling. Oh, yeah. did he? Yeah, he hired they, Well, they were also them. used in the film. Yes, they, well, yeah, of course, that's why. But we did all have a horse that we loved— and, and we go, would go riding together. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a thousand-acre estate around this great, great manor house. And, well, you can imagine that was like a dream. Yeah. Actually, to be truthful, that's where I got the idea from, for my first book, Mandy. That's where Jenny said, when we were playing a game, write me a story. And uh, so I thought she's gr- grown up more in a sophisticated town situation when she was with her mum and her dad. So why don't I try to write something 
about a country girl and out came the first book. And it was so fortunate because there was this beautiful estate and I could just look at it and decide what to describe and how. And it was great fun. But it was two years before I was able to get it to her. So it took that long. <laughs> now, Emma, you, obviously, my kids are aware that I have a television show, but it is not a television show for kids. So they are aware of what I do, but they don't experience what I do. Your mother was making films for kids, that like beloved films for kids. So at what age were you aware of who she was and, and where she fit in the world? I I'll tell, I, darling, tell the story when you yes, were shot. Yes, yes, I will. Oh, so the, the first time that I really became aware was, I, I must have been about three. So even though I was a baby, an infant, when mom moved to L.A. to begin work on Mary Poppins, because of the nature of the film and how many special effects and how much post-production well, was maybe involved. maybe other movies, too. Yeah. Yeah. It was about two years before it was edited and then released. And... So I was about three, and I went to a department store, um, to a to a kid's clothing section of a department store with, with me. With, no, you weren't there. Oh, no, I, was, I wasn't. Not that no, long, you no, weren't there. Right. I was with a babysitter. And the department store, the kid's section, was using Mary Poppins, I guess, presumably it had just come out, and they were using all of the themes from Mary Poppins and the imagery from Mary Poppins as a display, and everywhere I looked in this kid's clothing section, there were these life-size cu cardboard cutouts of my mom. And I remember saying to my babysitter, look, there's mommy. And next to me was, you know, a pair of women, some somebody else's moms, shopping for their kids. And I overheard them say to each other, isn't that sweet? That little girl <laughs> thinks her mother's Mary Poppins. <laughs> and I was like... But no, but she is. She really is, you know. Yeah. So that oh. was the first time I became really aware of it. And then from then on, I think I was, you know, I quite often I spent time with mom on set. So I was able to see the work in progress. What I love, too, is a whole generation later when your son was growing up and was, was a very small child, same age as Emma in the, in the store, um, her son went to a birthday party with a friend and they actually were showing as a treat for the birthday guests they were showing Mary Poppins <laughs> and she hadn't really gotten into any of that had you with him no uh, I, I I hadn't shown him any of the films but and... he was too young really so, but when when you arrived you found him pressed against the screen <laughs> of the television uh just looking terribly puzzled. Tell the rest of it, though. <laughs> yeah, he, he was, you could tell that he recognized something about the, the movie and he didn't know what it was. And so <laughs> I walked over to him and I said, does, does that lady look familiar to you, Sam? And he said, yes. And I said, do you think you might know who it is? And he said, yes. And you could tell he was, he couldn't quite work it out. And I said, do you think think it might be Granny Julie? And he went, yes! <laughs> <laughs> and then the sweet thing is that I happened to visit like half a day later and the difference, I mean, it was like, hello, Granny Jules, I know something <laughs> about you. And it was just so adorable. It really was. <laughs> I like that when you said in that story, oh, that's my mom about uh, Mary Poppins, those women also could think, oh my God, this poor girl. Her mom's so absent, she thinks the nanny's her mother. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> she thinks this icon on the, on the screen is her mom. Yeah. It's so sad. It's so sad. It was her. very sad. Pathetic, yeah. yeah. I, was, I was damaged. Yeah. Now, uh, Julie, it seems crazy to even ask about family trips for someone who grew up in England so close to the onset of World War II. I would imagine that uh, travel was not something you were doing as a young no, person. No, actually... I don't mean to play my violin, but we were so poor, Seth. And I was working at, from, oh, I think nine or 10 years old, having this kind of freak singing voice. And I went traveling with my mother and my stepfather, who were in vaudeville and musical, getting a, un, unknown to me, getting a fabulous education about watching from the wings every, everywhere I went and so on. But the truth is that we were so poor, we never went. I don't recall a single vacation that we had, but 
because we traveled so much and I eventually did the same thing and went out on my own, uh, there wasn't much. So it wasn't until really I started doing the movies because I was working on Broadway after that. And then finally Hollywood in between films gave me some time to spoil myself a little bit, but it was mostly trips with family, wasn't it, darling? And uh, yeah, uh, when I married Blake, uh, he loved boats. He loved all kinds of fun things. And so he had a boat and we went for a holiday or so on that. And it was heavenly. And also we rented twice, I think, a boat in the south of France just for the family. For Or Blake would make a movie in the south of France, but rent a boat that we could live on. So it all became tied in together and was was simply wonderful for me, particularly if I wasn't in his movie, you know. It was one of the all the all the Panthers and so on. The other thing was my mom and, and Blake fell in love with Switzerland, where we went one Christmas as sort of a an experiment. And so then that became a, a family tradition was to spend Christmases in Switzerland and, and we bad. actually ended up living there for a couple of we years. We loved it. We absolutely yeah. loved well, we've had that little house there for what 60 something years now oh my goodness yeah, almost. yeah so we do get away i imagine when people see you in switzerland they probably think oh i just i bet everybody here looks like julie andrew that can't actually be her <laughs> well now you have to tell the story mom of when you were practicing yeah yeah <laughs> i was about to uh, go to to do some concerts particularly some in las vegas and before that in London. And I had to get myself in shape. I had to get my voice in shape and all kinds of things. And of course, we live on a, well, our home is on a very pretty mountain. So I decided to walk around, go up the hill, round at the back and down and get my legs strong and uh, all of that. And there was no one around. There's never anybody really in the area where we are. And so I began to sing, the hills are alive, rather loudly. <laughs> And a whole group of Japanese tourists came up and over the hill with all their cameras looking very puzzled. <laughs> and uh, it was hilarious. It really was. But oh. it has resonated with me so much that that. I mean, moment. they must have, they must go home and go like, what they do is they have a lookalike and the lookalike oh, walks I around. See. Oh, you mean I was just <laughs> placed there. <laughs> yeah. Tour, uh, they tourist went, no one would think it was the real. They were like, I'm sure it's just somebody they hire. <laughs> might be. Emma, I don't know if you know this story, but Blake and I, I said to him something like, you know, we don't ski because he had a bad, very bad back. And we decided we'd try to go cross-country skiing, which required a complete outfit each, uh, you know, the sort of knickerbockers and the square-toed shoes and the long stockings to the knee and all of that. So we outfitted ourselves and, and got a wonderful um, ski instructor and were driving down the hill to, uh, and we, it was a very steep hill, uh, driving down the hill to meet the ski instructor. And Blake looked at me and I looked at him and he said, do your pants have a zipper? <laughs> and I said, yeah. He said, well, mine don't. <laughs> and he'd gotten in my trousers and I'd gotten in his. And he insisted on changing pants out of the car. We were on, still on the hill. Luckily, happily, nobody came by, but we swapped swapped that out and uh, got on with the day. But it was so stupidly funny. This is Blake. I just, um, uh, I would, I worry that maybe people aren't lucky enough to know. Blake Edwards is a fantastic uh, director. Film director, of films. yeah, yeah. Actually, he thought of himself as a writer, Seth. And then, of course, he was a fabulous director. Well, I would, this is a true story that will tell you a lot about our father who uh, gave us a film education. He loved comedies. He loved movies from that era and he loved Blake Edwards films. Uh, this is a true story. I saw the movie SOB before I saw Sound of Music. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> that sounds very appropriate. I'm glad you it's, did. It's yeah. very, our, we, I always say that our parents introduce us to things at such an age inappropriate uh, times. times. <laughs> but I think that is, I do think it's why we're both in comedy. I think you, yeah, if you see things like that, it. well, oh. then everything that's for kids, you think is bad. Because yes. if you've actually seen comedy for adults, you're like, you know, this is just for, this yeah. is bad stuff. <laughs> There's it's some good shocked, stuff out right? there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but, you know, um, every single scene in that film, except maybe 
one is based on Hollywood truth. And uh, yes. there's nothing in it that doesn't represent someone or uh, uh, something that happened. And, of course, everybody loved, the, all the cast loved being in it because they were ribbing themselves or I was ribbing my, I was teasing myself. And it's a good movie about the follies in that happen in Hollywood. And uh, who's the wonderful actor that was buried at sea by his friends, darling? Um, uh, Richard, Richard Mulligan. Mulligan. No, no, yeah, Mulligan was the actor. Oh, but, but the other actually, one, the the, the the one it really happened to oh, was yeah. John Barrymore. Ah, and his friends were so appalled that he was in a coffin that they actually went in and stole the coffin, as you know in the movie, and be- gave him a really wonderful Viking burial at sea. So that all that's true, and so many other things. Mm. Talking about being at sea, when you had a boat that you were living on for a while, how did you find boat life? Where can you sleep on a boat? Well, I always oh, yes, I you mean, never stop sleeping. Rock to sleep. <laughs> I never stop loving that. It's it's an absolute passion to to be on a boat, and it's the only time I think that I become now. We don't have a boat now, but we had a a sweet one and we loved her dearly. And if I ever see a beauty, a really wonderful boat, I am so envious. I can't stand it. It's not like me to be awful about or mean about things, but looking at a great boat, it's the only thing I really lust after (laughs) other than my (laughs) husband, of course. We we say she has boat lust. I did have boat lust. Yes. What was your boat's name? Impulse. Oh, very Which, lusty, yeah. a very lusty name. <laughs> yes, well, we bought her on an impulse, so there you are. But I think part of it had to do, I mean, you know, the, the, the time when we were really spending so much time on boats was pre-cell phone era, pre-internet. And I think it was as much about a, it being a true escape. Yes, you're on your own little island in a, in a strange way. Yeah, you know, no one could get to her, no one could reach her, no one could touch her kind of thing when she was on the Oasis. And that's what we loved about it. I wonder if that would be true today now with cell phones and email and all of that. I don't think we would have the same feeling of total escape. We used to take the boat, mostly we took it up to British Columbia. The boat we bought, it was built in Seattle. And so it was an inland waterways boat to a great extent. So we take the boat up to Vancouver or Victoria or you know, British Columbia, whatever. And that, I think, in terms of vacations, was some of the loveliest because other than the great delight of, of I mean, how lucky could we all be? It was either a, a wonderful holiday. Well, I think maybe we had a boat first and then we went to Switzerland. I can't remember. Did Blake captain the boat? No, he could. But no, we had a wonderful, wonderful ex-Marine who is tough and rough and sweet. Yeah. And yeah. I think I'd rather have a Marine than a comedy writer. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, my God, yes. <laughs> um, Seth's wife's family has like a motorboat. And how how big and what's her name, uh, Seth? Uh, it's So their their last name is Ash and it's Ash Can. Oh, I oh, love great. that. Yeah. Hilarious. Oh, that's so that's great. Nice. Um, and his wife is like an excellent pilot of that of that. Boat. Vessel. And Seth, I don't know. Have you ever even held the controls, Seth? No. Nobody, yeah. I don't want to, and uh, and I still want to less than other people want me to. <laughs> mm, they just want to see Nobody you wants me to I touch it. I can see you it. in a rakish cap and... Oh, I wear a rakish cap. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. But I sort of, I sort of stand at the stern. Oh, I see. And uh, yeah. I look back towards where, I sort of check the wake. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, very nice. Very nice indeed. They give me jobs like if the water skier falls down, tell us. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> First mate, it. you are. But you know, just just going anywhere and in private is, you know, you see dolphins, you see flying fish, you yeah. see what yeah. and whales sometimes. You know, amazing. I loved. I absolutely loved boat life, and um, well, yeah, I think we all, both do, and we all, yeah, we all yeah. did, and and all the attendant activities that that surround that. So, you know, nature watching, bird watching, water skiing. Being underway in skiing. the rain. And yeah. seeing bears, seeing bald eagles, all of that. Lovely. Hey, we're going to take a quick break and hear from some of our sponsors. Family Trips is sponsored by Airbnb. Hey, Bashi. Yes, Sufi. You know my in-law's home. It's a beautiful home. 
Oh, gorgeous. So cozy and comfortable. Cozy, comfortable, and they're thinking about selling it. No. Yeah. And so my wife, my sister-in-law, my brother-in-law, they don't want them to get rid of it. And they said, why don't you consider it as an Airbnb? They're traveling a lot in their retirement. They're enjoying the world. But don't give up a beautiful home. Let that beautiful home be an Airbnb. Make money while you're gone and do not lose a house that your children are desperate to inherit. I think people worry about, is this going to be too much work? And it's not too much work. If you've made your house into a lovely place to be, then someone's going to Airbnb it and they're going to be delighted to be there and they will be lovely, nice guests. I mean, mom and dad often will come to stay with me and that's fine, but I'd rather they Airbnb our home. See a shrine to Josh Myers and one solitary photo of me. <laughs> that's what you'd be getting if you airbnb their house and you know it's true. Yeah, and again, another comfy, cozy house that anyone would be delighted to be spending some time in. And remember, you don't have to Airbnb your whole house. It can be a guest house. It can be a spare room. There's a ton of options. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much more at airbnb.com slash host. Support for Family Trips comes from AG1. You know, I first gave AG1 a try because four years ago I went vegan because I know there are things I'm missing in my diet. And it's nice to know that I start my day with AG1 and I've just got a baseline of good stuff to keep me going. I feel like I've got more energy. I feel healthier. I got focus and I feel good. Well, the ingredients I'm into, it's that vitamin Z and zinc to support my immune health, which I need because I live with three germ machines who I love very much. They're my kids. Well, that's because AG1 is a foundational nutritional supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. And it helps me. I feel a lot more energetic, which I need because sometimes my podcast co-host gives me nothing. And I feel like I'm doing <laughs> everything by myself. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com slash trips. That's drinkag1.com slash trips. Check it out. Here we go. So Emma, your childhood was going back and forth. I would assume you traveled quite a bit from I coast did. to coast. Yes, yeah, she did. And not just coast to coast. When I was 10, we moved back to England for a little while, and then we moved to Switzerland for a couple of years, and then we moved back, you know, so there was a lot of England to New York. Or, that was this side of the family, and your dad uh, did a lot of traveling. My dad was in New York, yeah. Didn't you go also down to Santa Fe or something? Yep, we went to Santa Fe. That was a memorable vacation. We drove one summer. He was working for the Santa Fe Opera, and my stepmother and he decided to give my stepsister and I, who were just a year apart in age and very good, very close, the experience of driving across country. So we took the southern route from New York to Santa Fe, and we spent the first three or four days as we came down the East Coast visiting all the caverns in the Carolinas and Virginia, looking at all the stalactites and the stalagmites and, and all of that. And then I came down with chickenpox. <laughs> Going across country, poor lady. Had, yeah, like three or four days into the trip, I suddenly came down with chickenpox. And they had to smuggle me in and out of the motels that we stayed in from that point <laughs> forward until we got to Santa Fe because I should have been in quarantine. Right. And I, I suspect that, you know, that chickenpox virus may still be bouncing around down there in some of those caverns. <laughs> <laughs> How many people I must have infected? It mind yeah. boggles to think about that. There was a, a whole, trail. I remember there was a, yeah. there's a historical strain of cavern pox that they never figured out. There you go. That's out. my fault. 100%. They never figured out who patient zero was for the cavern pox. <laughs> exactly. Oh, oh. Come on, you guys. Uh oh, now I've I've told my I've told my secret. So my wife is from near Santa Fe. Oh. And so we we go back there. And I will say the Santa Fe Opera House is one of the most uh it's, it's a gorgeous. It's pretty magnificent, yeah. Mm -hmm. a gorgeous place to be. It sure that's is. nice that you were close with your step siblings. I would imagine that's uh, that's an important part of what seems to be a very unique childhood. Did you were you aware of I'm living a, a uniquely international multi-city existence? 
I was. And, were you? Um, I didn't think I, you were. Yeah. Oh, no, I absolutely was. And I, you know, I had, and they were very different households culturally that the, the, the energy and the dynamics in, in my mom and Blake's house was very different than the, that of my father and my stepmother. So I spent some time reinventing myself on the plane rides in between the two families <laughs> to sort of, you know, reposition myself back into that particular family I was heading back to. But I also had the unique position of having occupied every place on the birth order chart. So I, I was the only child of my mother and father. But then when they separated and remarried, I gained a younger stepsister on my father's side. So I became the eldest. And I gained two older step siblings on mom's side. And I became the youngest. And then eventually mom and Blake adopted two children. And I got two younger half sisters. And then I was the middle child. So I I have literally occupied every position on the birth chart. And, She's uh, very empathic, very empathic. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. is a good question. Which is ideal? What's the best? Well, there is no best. It's just it depends on what your needs are and depends on the day, you know. Yeah. But I and think how the rest of them behave, darling. Truth yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I think one thing that was nice was that whenever if ever my any of my siblings got on my nerves, I could always kind of internally hold on to the knowledge that I was actually an only child, you know, the <laughs> yeah. only child of my my two parents. And so I had that to hold I do on think to. it makes you uniquely equipped to be a children's book author that you have held every position because, of course, you are I think so. writing for all kids. And sometimes I'm only an older sibling, and so I have no patience for younger siblings. <laughs> I feel like... <laughs> That's not fair. In fact, my publisher has already said no to Younger Kids or Parasites, my second <laughs> book. That, Which one beats up the other more? Uh, we, weren't a be- we weren't a beat up kind I was going to ask that. Wait, it, uh, is, the, is the bear and the rabbit you two? I, the bear and the rabbit is us because I am the one who is scared. I will say Josh and I did not beat anybody up, but I am overly cautious and my brother is overly adventurous and... I was, feel as he though, was safer because he had you above him, maybe. No, no, no. He was the one who took all the chances. No, I get injured <laughs> all the time. <laughs> I've had so many broken bones and whatnot. Yeah. It, the interesting thing is, I am cowardly, and my brother's bravery has made me feel very comfortable that I made the right choice. He's always breaking <laughs> bones, and I just think I oh. love. I had brothers and half brothers and all kinds of things because my parents remarried and so on. So the littlest brother was the cutest and the sweetest and probably the smartest. And I looked out of my window one day and could see him on on the lawn of our garden. And this was when I was, you know, in my teens or something. But his other brother was with friends and just beating him to pieces. I mean, they had one leg pinned this way and an arm pinned that way and yeah, kill him, get rid of blah, blah, blah. A game, uh, supposedly. And I heard my youngest sweet little brother sort of cough gently and then sort of laugh nervously and said, oh, now let's pretend I get away, he said. And <laughs> I absolutely, I never, ever forgot it. It was such a smart, <laughs> and he did. Yeah, it was, it's really, it's oh a very God, smart and he was player. terrified, I could tell. Yeah, you can almost see the older siblings sort of something clicking in their head where it's confusing enough that that yeah. gives him just enough time to make to get, that great escape. Yeah, yeah. and to he make did. the getaway. Yeah, now let's pretend I get away. <laughs> so, Julie, I think you were probably, based on your early vaudeville days, you were taking business trips at an age that most uh, people do not. Right, but also, to a certain extent, in fact, quite a large extent, taking care of all my younger siblings too. So, I mean, when they were very small babies, my, being in vaudeville, my mother and stepfather traveled a lot. And then we had a kind of a sort of au pair that stayed with us and so on. And then uh, eldest sister, I was the bossy, mean elder sister, <laughs> as far as they were concerned. But um, I did do an awful lot of uh, looking. Maybe that's why we do children's books, darling. I don't know. Yeah. But I don't think it's you did, that. In, but you also traveled with your parents a lot when you started performing with them, and yes, you did a I lot did of, at first. Yeah, they they went they would hit the road in a caravan. Oh, I was going to ask if it was rail travel, but it was yeah. you no, all... it was that too. Tremendous okay. rail travel. When particularly, I went out on my own 
quite young, and that was when it was rail travel. But uh, when I was traveling with them as part of their act, uh, their vaudeville act, um, then uh, we would go in, we'd take the trailer with us and plug the electricity into any, and the water into any farm that would allow us to, and when we got to where we needed to be. And so was it a caravan, like a sort of covered wagon caravan? Was it? Well, it, yes, it was just one sort of arc and very tiny, but it, it took mum and dad, and m- not mum and stepdad and toddler, you know, and it wasn't that pleasant, but it was mm-hmm. fun <laughs> when it was raining and you could hear, you know, you were all snug in this very small space, and uh, but you were safe and you could hear you know, the rain coming down on the roof. How would you pull that caravan? Was it horse-drawn or was it... No, we had a trailer. We, I mean, we had a big enough car, a very old Packard mostly, with uh-huh. that one of those things on the back of it that hooked to the trailer. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, great. When you were going on your own, traveling by rail, going to different cities, were you the kind of person that would walk around and look at the city or were you too concerned about that evening's performance to... A little bit of both. Since I was mostly, when I went out on my own, for maybe one year I had a sort of chaperone or a tutor or somebody that traveled with me. But once I hit 15, I was on my own. And so it was a very interesting time and I couldn't wait to get home each weekend because I was so lonely, you know. But my parents always asked, we mostly with a group that played a week in every place. And I traveled over England, honestly, three times over. I mean, just round and round and round all of England. And then certain people who, who my mother knew would kind of keep an eye out for me, but it wasn't terribly good a lot of the time. So I was very lonely and couldn't wait to get home at the weekend and would go from the north of England all the way south on the train or overnight just to get a day and a half at home. Yeah. she. We wrote about this in, in one of the memoirs, but she would make the dressing room of each of these seedy old vaudeville houses. Well, my mom let, helped me do that too. I mean, she made me take things with me. But yeah, on, she would yeah. try to make it into as much of a home as possible by, you know, laying a, a towel out on the on the stained makeup table and, you know, trying to, you know, putting out a little photo of the family or a bunch of flowers, you know, a bunch of that. flowers, things yeah. to make it feel more like a friendly home base. It was the yeah. end of vaudeville. It was the dying days of, in England, of the dying days of vaudeville. And so all the theaters were very, very old and crusty and smelly. Uh-huh. <laughs> How big were audiences in those houses? <laughs> You know, I wouldn't know. Okay. Probably 1,500, something like that. No. You know, they were, they were lovely theaters or once had been lovely theaters. Sure. With, you know, balconies and a circle and then the, the orchestra. And honestly, I think it was mostly the landladies that I was not very fond of. You know, one stayed in a bed and breakfast or something like that, which had been booked for one. And uh, if one was lucky, somebody from the company would... And one of the acts from the from the theater would also be there as well, but it was an education it was a I didn't get an education much in terms of going to school, but my God, I got one just traveling around and when I did ask my mother whether I should really go to a proper school and get my grades and you know all of that, she said, "Oh, you'll learn far more from being on the road, darling." <laughs> So that's the way it was. And now yeah. you've authored over 30 books, so you're really a bad advertisement for paying for yeah, an education. Yeah, well, I've, <laughs> I've drawn on some of those experiences, though. I mean, you know, you work with the most amazing people, dog acts and bird acts and all those kind of things. and uh, Bear acts. Bear acts, yes. Even, even my parents worked with an alligator act, too. Which, but the bears, you could not go backstage when the bears were coming down the corridors or being led to the stage for their act, because anything that was behind them, they would turn and uh, I supposedly attack. So um, one stayed in the dressing room very safely and uh, <laughs> until they'd passed. That would be one you would not have to tell me twice. The, That's right. The rules That's about, right. Yeah. hey, we have a few bears in the hallway rules. 
Yeah, um, right. Exactly. <laughs> yes, that would be great. <laughs> Uh, what was I mean? An alligator act is very. It's fun to just even think about what an alligator. I act don't would honestly be. know yeah. because that was what my parents told me. They worked with an al- with alligators, but can That's you really, imagine? I mean, really. Yeah. Well, the terrible. best would be if it was a tap dancing alligator. That would be. <laughs> <laughs> but I imagine it was less than that. I bet it was there was one impressive. one lady that my mother told me about, and I subsequently worked with her, and. You know, you always took band call on a Monday morning. You laid your books down in front of the conductor for a rehearsal, and that's all you had until Monday night when you started your week. And so my mum watched this lady come onto the stage, give her books to the, the conductor, and then she would walk up and down the stage and indicate a twirl here and a, and a bow there or a <laughs> wonderful ballet stance or whatever. and. My mum thought, well, she must be a terrific dancer because she was, you know, whirling and so on and so forth. And she thought, I must watch this woman. She looks very interesting. And that night she came on in a hideously coloured floral tatty dress and a troop of dogs followed her on stage. And so (laughs) she was, you know, cupping her arms and they were jumping through them like hoops and all of that kind of thing. And... It was always a surprise of some kind. <laughs> That's really funny that your mom's note to her would be like, you should just do it without the dogs. I enjoyed lo- I enjoyed watching you without the dogs. <laughs> oh, God. So, Emma, now, uh, do you, how many children do you have, Emma? I have two, and they're grown now. One is 20 and one is 27, so. And did they ever travel? Did you ever take them to where Julie was? Did they ever visit their grandmother? They did. A couple of concerts, I think. Yeah, mostly for concerts. And then, of course, we did our own family vacations, my husband and I and the kids together. But one of our favorite places to go, my family and I, is to this little island in the English Channel where my mom carried me when she was pregnant for one summer, which was the uh, the reason they were there was a function of having gone there with T.H. White, Tim White, who wrote The Once and Future King, on which Camelot was based. And so my mom and dad had spent quite a bit of time there before I was born. And then all through my childhood and later in my adult years with my own kids, I've been back there many, many times. And a lot of your dad's relatives. Your and dad's almost, relatives. Yeah, yeah, almost all, both my grandparents on my father's side and many, many cousins and so forth have ended up moving there and living there. And How small an island is it? One and a half by two and a half miles. Yeah, oh, wow. one and a half by three, a mile and a half wide and three miles long. And yeah. and there are 13 forts ranging from... Uh, all the way around, all around the island. Yeah, Roman yeah. all the way through, uh, you know, wow. Georgian and Victorian and a tremendous history and at least as many pubs. That's good. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's, you'd like to see at least a one for one on pub to fort. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. How did your American children enjoy that summer vacation? Oh, my gosh. I mean, I loved it as a kid. They loved it when they were kids. It's one of those places where you can let your kids run free and you don't worry. Because Not much you can do in two and a half miles. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> right. it really isn't, there isn't much trouble they can get into without running into someone they know. And it's very wild and rugged, you know, beautiful beaches and cliffs. But speaking of the war, there were so many underground places where there used to be guns or, you know, big, big, uh, uh, I guess you'd know more about that, darling. Yeah, it's the only British territory that was occupied by the Germans during World War II. And they came... Those islands, yeah. Those islands, yeah. They got that far. They came in and took over and it was considered a very strategic position for them. And so they converted many of the Victorian and Georgian and Roman forts uh, by adding, you know, big German bunkers and things onto them. And now, of course, the, the... the astonishing thing is that most of them are being reclaimed by nature. Most of that old, uh, you know, old, old fortification has either been converted into, you know, someone's private home, or there is one that's out on a causeway that is a holiday rental property that you that gets cut off by the tide twice a day, and you live by the tide tables. And so and then some of them are just being slowly reclaimed by nature by gorse bushes and blackberries and um, thistle and things like that, and it just sort of being brought back. But it does have quite a unique history, doesn't it, darling? It really does. It's an amazing place. And my son 
It made such an impression on him when he was a kid that he ended up writing about it in his college essay applications. And I think it was, you know, one of the things that helped him get into a great school. So, oh, wow. Yeah, it paid off. Was there a documentary, or not a documentary, a miniseries about a, a German occupation in the British Island? There is a documentary about the occupation in the islands. And just recently, there was an article in the New York Times about it, too. So now I fear that they've been discovered. Yeah, we don't want you to say the name of your island. Yeah, We've, that's why you. we haven't been Everyone asked. go to Guernsey. Go to exactly. the one island over. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> We've already had one occupation. We don't need the rest. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. How long would you take your kids in the in the summer? As much time as I could. Usually we would go for about a month. And when I was 16, I spent an entire summer there. And that was a very seminal summer for me because I lived, my grandparents had retired and, and were living on the island. And my closest cousin and I spent the summer living in this little cottage that had been my mom's and dad's. Wow. And we were 16 years old, and we were it was just the two of us and our best friend, who was also 16. And I will leave the rest of the details to your imagination, but it was a very hey, thank you, thank seminal you, summer. <laughs> oh, it sounds magical. It was mm. totally magical. In spite of quite a bit of rain, and it got, I mean, if you survived the first four days there, because it was such a narrow little island yeah. that if you survived the first four, you'd come out radiantly healthy. <laughs> and the other thing was we knew my grandparents were down the road if there was an emergency, you know, which was great. And we all had jobs that we had to work for the summer. So my my cousin was uh, managing a little clothing store. Our fr Our dear friend who was with us was working as a janitor at the local hospital. And I was a chambermaid at one of the little bed and breakfasts. And uh, boy, was that an education. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Now, what age did your kids, because I know there's that moment where kids don't want to go away for the summer because of their, you know, their friends, friends. and their social mm -hmm. life. Where What's the breaking point? Yours are 27 to 20. When were they like, we don't want to go to the No, island. actually, they still want to go. Oh, good. Yeah, good. they still want to go, um, mainly because my cousin had kids the same age as them. And Perfect. so for them, it was an excuse to see their cousins. And when you get to be a teenager, it is a paradise, that island, because there are all these what they call bunker parties, which are oh. where they, they take over these old bunkers with the <laughs> microphones and the music and kegs and you name it. There's a really funny yeah. thing happening, which is um, Julie's already wearing headphones for the podcast, yeah. but then she's also covering her ears to not hear them. <laughs> <laughs> I was Same thing as just what was happening. with perfume yeah. when you're on the... That's how, right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, just spray your perfume now as loudly as you can. We're gonna... <laughs> right, right. Well, that's one. I mean, I will say, I would imagine, too, as an American, you go um, somewhere where they're a little more lax at the door of a pub. It's probably a very nice way to... And yeah, again, we will leave the rest of the imagination. Indeed, I'm not gonna. You. I'm not going to put uh, a Dame there Julie certain, Andrews certain through this. There were portions of the island long before even you were born, darling, that were so radiantly pretty with either heather or beautiful gorse or something that was just coming out all over the island. So it was either pink or yellow, and it grew the best tomatoes, tomatoes, excuse me, just about a month before England's crop came out because it was that different a climate, really. And it was just everything about it was a kind of wonderful. The ferry would come in every day and bring... Uh, supplies for the local grocer's, grocery store, but it didn't come in at all if the weather didn't allow the ferry to get in. Yeah, there's, sometimes uh, you'd get, you know, bananas once a week if the weather was bad, and the wind was <laughs> blowing the wrong way. But actually, my one of my cousins, her eldest daughter lives, still lives full time on the island, and she and her husband started a cooperative farm there. And so they are now pretty much uh, keeping the entire island in fruit and vegetables. What an wow. outstanding thing that is. Yeah. Um, and Julie, for the record, please, I'll say tomato, but you say tomato. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, I can, I can do either, you know. It doesn't well, feel right for you to say tomato. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> it doesn't seem right, yeah. yeah. Well, you, this has been just absolutely a delight. Thank you so much. But before we let you go, Josh has some questions that we ask all of our guests. And oh, also, I don't do know if we've now. talked about that you, you have yet another book 
coming out. Yes, exactly. Waiting in the Wings, book 36 or thereabouts, which is uh, hitting shelves on April 30th. So grab a copy of that. And this is a duck-based book, correct? Ducks in the theater, yes. And is this your first time that you've used ducks? It is. Yeah, we've we've done mice uh, and cats. Yeah. But we, but we've and never done that. To our before. surprise, we don't realize that we've written yet an, another animal book and enjoyed it very much. But it uh, also, in in our little sort of research here, it does say it's based on a true story. It is actually, it is, yeah. So my husband and I built and co-founded a, a region, as I mentioned earlier, a small regional theater, and uh, out on the east end of Long Island. And one spring, a pair of ducks nested in one of our uh, planter boxes in the courtyard. And we were so thrilled and excited and waiting for the big day when all the eggs would hatch. And we made very sure to keep, you know, the the nest and, and the ducks protected when audiences would come passing through the courtyard and ex- ent- entering and exiting Not the theater. there was a nest there. Yeah. Yeah. And when the ducks, when the eggs started hatching, what we did not know was that the moment the last egg hatches, the mother duck tries to hustle the babies to the nearest water as quickly as possible to get them out of harm's way. So they will nest in a dry area, but then they will go quickly to the water within an hour of hatching. And uh, we were looking out the window, and all of a sudden we started to see ducklings toppling out of the planter and landing on the on the pavement and the mother duck was standing there quacking at them like come on come on come on we got to get going and the and the father duck as well and all of a sudden they began to march towards the road towards the wharf where our theater is situated and we were terrified they were going to march into oncoming traffic and or encounter dogs or you know other things and also you have to mention that your theater was built on this long yeah, long, at, at the base of this long wharf of, yeah. that juts out into the water. And so we quickly mobilized the entire company and everybody ran outside and we created this sort of human uh, barricade or chorus line around them and stopped traffic and stopped pedestrians and dogs and you name it he and escorted it. them. Yeah. Escorted them to the water. Yeah, it was it was great. There was lots of uh, lots of enthusiasm. But of course, she chose, the mom didn't go the shortest way to the water. She chose the longest route (laughs) down the entire wharf um, to the very end. And then they all started toppling into the water. That's uh, that's how you know you have a theater duck when they choose the most traumatic. (laughs) But we just kind of embellished our little story because it was too sweet. Yeah, we figured that, you know, you can't write a story about ducks in the theater for kids without having at least one of them go into the theater of and course. see the show. Yeah, so, of course. Yeah. So that's so where we So based on a true story, but some embellishments. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We think. I mean, for all we know, you know. Right, right be, exactly. Somebody could have snuck in. But. Um, yeah, there still could be a duck doing monologues in that theater there to this be. day. <laughs> Julie's never love, worked, Julie's never ducks, worked so. with a duck act. She would uh, love to. <laughs> no, my parents worked with a bird act. They were pigeons, and they wouldn't, at the end of the act, before my parents came on. They were a singing and uh, entertainment act of, of music. But the the bird act was the pigeons, and they were called by their owner or whatever from the balcony, from everywhere, and they all came and landed on his arms. But one night they didn't. And so my mother and father <laughs> were doing the opening song, and there were birds flying everywhere around them <laughs> and craziness. And ducking, right? Yeah, sure. yeah. We, we yeah. haven't written about that yet, have we, done? Yeah. <laughs> No. Uh, next up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I wonder how the how that act ended when the guy tried to get the pigeons to come back and said, Oh well, anyway. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. And how Here much comes you some know, song and dance. How much stuff was on the stage and all of that. <laughs> oh, that oh. that would be the part I would worry about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right, some finishing questions here. You can only pick one of these. Is your ideal vacation relaxing, adventurous, or educational? Can I pick two? Sh- I'm no. sure. <laughs> No, I wasn't going to give you more than one, Emma, but for I Julia. Know, I, look, I knew Julia was going to try to pull No, this. no, my perfect vacation, which I fantasize and haven't actually done yet, is to go somewhere wonderful on the beach and read a book under the tree on the sand or, you know, whatever, that kind of thing. So half educational and pleasing myself with the book, but also lying and relaxing and taking it easy. I can't believe I, you've yet 
to manage to take a trip where you can sit on a beach and read a book. Yeah. I know. I know. Give, it's coming. Deserve, it's going to happen. You deserve that. Give Thank Julie you. Andrews a I think a break. so, too. And I really yeah, do. Everybody. God Thank damn you. it. Um, yes, I do. She's written 35 books and she hasn't read one. Yeah. <laughs> um, Emma, your preference? I, I guess I would say at this stage of my life, I would say educational. I love uh-huh. to learn about the history of a place or learn and, you know, yeah. to be surprised and, and to know myself better or to know the world better by, by going someplace new. Great. What is your favorite means of transportation? Train, plane, automobile, boat, bike? Boat. 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 Mm, couple boats. Gonna be boat. Boat. Yeah. Boat I knew it sure. wasn't going to be caravan for Julie. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> or no, horse. No. I, I actually would love to. I've often dreamt of doing like a dude ranch vacation. Or I know there are some like vacations in Ireland where you can take a horse and carriage or horse mm. and trail caravan. And or go they take place the to caravan place. to the next, or you, all your clothes and things, you know, to the next place, but you actually you ride, ride up the West Coast, I believe. Yeah, I'd love yeah. to do that. I would, actually. I've often nightmared about taking a vacation by horse. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's yours, <laughs> Seth? Have you, have you discussed that many times? No, I just don't. I don't like being on anything that doesn't have um, brakes. <laughs> <laughs> and Josh, where do you go? Um, I mean, my fiance is an equestrian, but I'm not a competent horseman. So uh, that that wouldn't yeah. be good. But for if me. she ever wants a wonderful vacation, a friend of mine did take this west coast of Ireland trip all the way up the quietest, most beautiful, uh, uh, you know, bays and and little homes, and it, you could do bed and breakfast and house yeah. your horse and then saddle up and go on from there. And she claims that it was one of the loveliest. No, vacation that, 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 that would work for us. That, that would, would work, work for her. I don't know if it would work for you, though. Yeah, we'd see. You'd have to check in with me after the first day and see how I was holding <laughs> up. How are um, your legs? If you could take a family vacation with any family, alive or dead, fictional or real, other than your own family, what family would you like to take a vacation oh with? Oh, my God. That's a, I think that's a virtually impossible. It's yeah. very difficult. The first With two are any kind of family. Easier. Well, if I will say family... I believe we've had at least one guest say the von Trapps. Just yes. I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. Oh, although I got to be honest, don't take this the wrong way. I feel like after a day, they'd be insufferable to be around. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> You'd be like, not everything is think... a song. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's true. I tell you, it, they'd have to have a boat. These people, my yeah. friends, would have to have a boat because since we don't have one now, <laughs> and I miss ours very much, then that would be. It could okay. be anybody if they Any had a boat. Any family with a boat. Yeah. We'll, we'll yeah. give them your email and have them reach <laughs> Comfortable out. Comfortable and beautiful and motoring and traveling and, you know, all of that. Yeah, I would go with that. Or I would go with a literary family like the March Sisters from oh, Little Women. One. I think that would be, mm. I think that would, that would be really interesting. They, I find them done. fascinating. And Julie, you are from Walton-on-Thames is your hometown? Yep. Walton-upon-Thames and married my first marriage was to Tony Walton. It was just happy accident that he was a Walton living in Walton on Thames. Yeah. Oh, I actually, I'm going to swing back for another question. But Walton on Thames, would you uh, recommend that as a vacation destination? Oh, God, I, I don't want to put it down, but no. It <laughs> okay, was, we, it don't, was, we don't think our hometown is a good vacation yeah, destination. So That's right. It was, some, it was suburbia and it was just a little bit of, a tiny bit of green and outer London. It used to be quite sweet, but then everybody started moving out of London and it gradually became more and more sort of... It's, these, it's more of a bedroom community, really. It's more of a you know place hot, where... You know, businessmen and people who... Um, yeah, people yeah. who work in London live because yeah. it's about it's a little less than half an hour from London. Very good. It was famous for... Um, we had a sports track in the middle of the village, and Roger Bannister, the first great miler, would train there. And uh, we didn't know he was Roger Bannister, but that's where he trained and was wonderful and became very famous. I think as an American, every time I hear one of those British towns that has a preposition in it, I assume it's very quaint. Well, it was on the Thames, and that made me a lover of rivers and inland waterways. It and still is on the Thames. Well, no, yes. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it hasn't dried up yet. Um, and there had, are some quaint spots. There's a very sweet little pub called the Swan right on the river. And it has a bridge that was painted by Turner that 
is All the right. great artist. Mr. Turner. But it isn't, it isn't so quaint, but it's all we really knew. And so, you know, it yeah. was what it I was. I don't think anyone's booking a vacation there at this yeah. moment. And that's no, fine. But, but that's on totally the river fine. or going up the river toward Oxford or somewhere like that is gorgeous to do. Yeah. And you um, get a real sense of history because that's the rivers were the great um, highways, you know, Henry Moore. Which that will be my next vacation. Not Henry Moore. Who am I thinking of, darling? The great man who was killed by Henry VIII. Oh, my oh, God. Uh, great yeah, artist? Um, no, the Paul Schofield. Uh, uh, That's um, right. Schofield played him. Uh, Cromwell? No, yeah. no. Uh, oh, my God. Cromwell. A man, no, a man for a man all seasons. Man for all seasons. Man there for all go. seasons, yeah. Yeah. Thomas More? It's a Thomas More. There we go. Oh, well, you well looked, done. you peeked and looked it up. I, can I did, I did look. <laughs> okay. I did. Julie got me. <laughs> Julie caught me dead to rights. Emma, what do you consider your hometown? Is it London or Los Angeles? It's definitely not Los Angeles. It's where I live now and have okay. lived for the for the past 30 something years, um, Sag Harbor in, in New York, Eastern Long Island. And would you recommend Sag Harbor as a vacation destination? Well, it is. it is a magnificent vacation destination and then many, many people vacation here, but it, it has become overrun uh, in the summer now. And so I would prefer not to recommend it because I don't think there's room for any more right. at this <laughs> point. Yeah. Is it good at least for the theater? How overrun it is? It is good for the theater. Yeah. It's, I mean, you know, the theater well, the is one very you much found it is there and thriving. That's what I yeah. Was. And it's, and you know, it's, Many businesses revolve around the resort community nature of the place, but uh, my favorite times of year are in the shoulder seasons. As yes, we call I would them, imagine. So, I yeah. would imagine. Yeah. Um, if you had to be stranded on a desert island with one member of your family, who oh, would God. it be? Ah, oh, I know. I I can answer that one for myself. Wonderful. Well, it, first of all, oddly, would be probably you, M, because we have such fun. Together, but also, <laughs> if he was still alive, my dad, who was a nature lover and uh, my real dad, and he loved literature and, and books and just introduced me to so many lovely things like that. He so would I have think, been very resourceful, too, in terms of foraging for food and things like that. Yes, yes. A real nature man. I have to say my husband, because he's such a good cook. Oh, so <laughs> I know he'd take care of As us. As Emma says, she married well. I know? did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, and Seth has our final questions. Have either of you been to the Grand Canyon? I have. I've flown over it. I've never actually been into it, which is a, it, actually something I would love to do. Okay, well, that was my follow-up. So you would like to go, Julie? Yes. And my question for you, Emma, is do you feel it is worth it? Well, I have a funny story about the Grand Canyon, Seth, and that is that I went... Did you get chicken pox there too? <laughs> no, but it was that same summer. <laughs> okay, gotcha. It was that same summer and I was 12 years old and for, I can't remember why, but I was in a snit about something that day and I refused to get out of the car. <laughs> Great. So Great. I saw the Grand Canyon through the car window while everybody else got out and walked around. I'm <laughs> really glad... I'm really glad I pressed you because the <laughs> fact that you said you'd been to the Grand Canyon and then the follow-up was, I didn't actually get out of the car. I never really saw it's it. It's so no. hard to get wow. there and then no. you didn't get out of the car. <laughs> but why the Grand Canyon? I feel like it is the most stereotypical family trips place in America. And you, so yeah. we like to close. And the other thing that's important to note is that Josh, and this goes back to a uh, sense of adventure and sense of caution, Josh really wants to go, and I have no interest. Ah, what about something like Yellowstone or? Yeah, all those work for me, and none of them probably for some. Well, Yellowstone it works a little bit better because there's not a canyon. I don't like the very idea of uh, anything with an edge. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Except humor, right? Yeah, I like right exactly. Look at you, Julie. Yes, I do like my humor to have a little bit of an edge. <laughs> <laughs> what, you know what? With that sharp last word, I think we can leave it there. What a delight uh, to yeah, spend time with both of you. Yeah, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you both. Thank and you so thank much. You. Oh, no, thank, thank you. you. So lovely to talk to you and meet you both. Thank you for having us. Of course. See you again, hopefully one yes, day. Yes, please. Bye, thank love. Thank you, thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Emma and Julie. Off and packed up their sundries Went to so many countries For films Barbados Or up to Ireland 
A manor house with horses in England But when you want to rest They will both attest That being on the water is the best Super califragilistic Don't sleep They are in agreement You have the nicest dreams And nobody bothers you Twice as nice as Edelweiss Boats sleep When the boats are gently rocking You best not come knocking Cause they're taking the nice news